on this computer. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, April 16th, 2023. I'm Larry Rhodes or DJ Doubter 5. And as usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Hey, it's the Wombat, DJ Wombat. There you go. And Boudreaux is with us. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. Here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about that after the mid-show break, so be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? What's so good about you? You? Yeah, I really want to know that. (laughs) But it's been a while since we've done a show because we had a holiday break. We had that thing called Easter. Easter came up. Uh And uh, or the spring equinox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what I celebrated. The spring equinox, (laughs) right? Or just chasing down some plastic uh, eggs with jelly beans inside of them and and finding them all over people's homes and jelly bellies. Yeah. And then realizing that there's, I think this year, a push for, I'm not sure if it's just this year, but. I never knew that there was a Christian motto for Easter, which is he has risen. I didn't know that was, Oh the, yeah. I didn't know that was a motto. I, I, uh-huh. I but I'm seeing it on more <clears throat> church signs. You know, those ones with the letters that they can, mm-hmm. they put up. It's not like every it's single because one. of the yeast. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a capital H and he, no matter where it is in the sentence. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But you know what? It's a capital letter, regardless of every single time I've seen it. Cause either people scream it out loud so it's all deserving of capitals, or it's in that block font that they put up on their church signs. But either way, right. it's, I had a good time. I went up to, uh, just rolling straight into like what we did the last couple of weeks, I went over to a friend of mine who is a Christian and celebrated it, uh, just a gathering at his home. What's great about this guy is he knows I'm an atheist. He knows I'm asexual. He He's totally cool with science, but he also is Christian and is generally like very inclusive with his family. His family's also Christian too, but like, all right, they're open to the idea of having like Jewish people over, Greek people over. They, the mindset they have is one where it's not, we're afraid of differences or different cultures or different ideas. They, they appreciate the uh, heterogeneity of, of mm. discussion and people and cultures. They're good people. And what I say is you can, you have a right to believe whatever you want in this country, but don't be intolerant or, or purposely ignorant or or harmful to those who have differing beliefs or or life practices they they em, em, uh, embody that very well so it was actually a good pleasure for me to go over to their place they did do that one thing though where they they cooked the food for everybody so it wasn't a potluck but they did the thing of like hey let's come over here and gather and pray and i kept my eyes open i looked around at the crowd while everyone was like in the kitchen and i saw people with their eyes open who were also scientists just like I don't know what's going on. I'm like pointing yeah. at them and they're like pointing at me. And then afterwards they're giving each other high fives. And I'm like, this is cool. This is cool. We yeah. have a lot of different people here. That's awesome. So mm-hmm. it is nice to see that. Uh, Boudreaux, how you been? How's been your last couple of weeks? I also see the shirt. I got a 5K shirt recently. Uh, I, but yeah, anyway. yeah, I saw you had a good time too. Thank That's... you. I appreciate it. Appreciate Great. it. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's been good. I, I just got back from Oklahoma City, uh, OKC. Okay. Which was what neat. I, I had a conference there, um, but it's a really cool conference where I'm friends with everybody there. We're all part of the planning committee. And so it was a good time. It was, uh, um, we got to see a Native American kind of, uh, uh, they did dance for us at the hotel and wow. explained, explained some of the instruments and, and stuff. So it was, it was cool. Very, yeah. very cool. Were you designing more diamond turnarounds? Like what was going on there? <laughs> so this is a GIS conference. So it's more about digital maps. Um, and that's the class I teach uh, in civil engineering. So it's perfect for, for me. But yeah, we're making making digital maps. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Hey, what question with digital maps? When you make a digital map, like, is it like similar to like Google Maps? Is it, does, is it always demonstrably on a 2D model? Like you are not, you are not <laughs> compensating for the curvature of Earth when you make a, a digital or map. Topo- or a topography. Right. Topology. Uh, 
So, so actually that, that's a whole lecture in, in, in my course about projections. Yeah. So we, we use, you want to use the right projection for the right job. So if you're just mm-hmm. looking at, if you're looking at like a Frisbee golf course, yes, you, you could, you could do it in, in geographic coordinate systems and yes. ignore projections because it's so close. Right. But, right. but if you, if you're doing something countywide and you want to measure area and things like that, you'll want right. to use a state coordinate system. Right. Um, in fact, you probably want to use a north or south uh, projection system. So, yeah. The reason why I bring that up is a lot of people don't understand that the value of science is that we make useful models first. The models are useful first and then accurate to the objective reality second because yep. they're yeah. only as valuable as they are useful. So, we yeah, I like, I like the, other, the old scientific uh, quote that says, I like standards. We got millions of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we've had people on the show. I've done interviews with people before who are like, don't you care about objective reality? Like Christians are asking me, like, don't you care about objective reality? It's like, I really care more about a model that I can test that's accurate. And whether it's nominally close to objective reality or not, that's that's fine. But if I can test it and I can use it to be useful and and navigate life in a in a predictable and useful and testable way that's far more useful to me than something that could be objectively true that i can't yeah. understand right yeah. or something so Absolutely. convoluted that i can't use it on a regular basis like too expensive to too complicated right. yeah oh yeah right i want a gas pedal where i just push it down and my car goes faster not one where i have to like tune and dial in <laughs> the amount of injecting fuel and yeah. like get it down to like the hundredth decimal it's like yeah. i don't that's way too complicated for me i just need to be able to do this yeah. i need a model that's simple and so the objective reality of the universe isn't that important to me and people take that little snippet and they're like yeah. oh he doesn't care about objective reality it's like to an point i actually don't i actually more am invested on models that get me close enough to the question that i have and that's fine with me. And then if I have a more specific question, I will happily take a more. Yeah, uh, as long as it's reliable, you, do, you yeah, don't want something right. that's not reliable. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want something that's not reliable. How do I get something that's reliable versus something that is reliable? I am able to test it. But yep. if I can't test it, if I have something that's so convoluted that's beyond any sort of testing that I have, I can't demonstrate that it's true even to begin with. Mm-hmm. So that's why I like those reliable models. Yes, I might know that there's an error margin there. For example, if I don't account for the curvature of Earth for my trip from here to McDonald's, there, I might be off, but I'll be, if it says, hey, it's going to take you 12 minutes to get there and I get there in like 11 minutes and 59 seconds, I'm like, that's fine. That's mm-hmm. totally fine. That works for me. That's for what I need it for. That's a very useful and accurate model. Good enough for me. And yeah. that's what science is all about. I really, really do. It's a it's a nuanced understanding, but it's one that is fundamentally potent in the world of science. It's just we got to get close to the truth to the point where it's useful to continue to use it and test it. And beyond that, we're good. We're good. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes. Love it. Love it. Great job. What what a great conference. I hope uh, were your family able to come with you. No, this is uh, uh, I'm so busy that it's it's hard to. Hard to invite anyone else to come because they wouldn't see me. Uh, we're all going to Mexico in June. Ooh, June. Very yeah. cool. Buju, life after, or do you feel like life has now accelerated back to your uh, pre-COVID phase? Yeah. Um, I, I saw surprisingly few masks actually on this journey. Um, uh, I, I've traveled a little bit before this and, and and saw a lot more masks. So I think that that that's kind of like a measure of 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 is it still here, but also, uh, yeah, I feel like, well, a good well, friend of mine actually just tested positive, but, uh, yeah. um, well, it's but, officially over. Yeah. You know, president I, Biden said so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm still getting vaccinated if they, if they still got, Oh them. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause it will mutate. Yeah. 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 And, and so, uh, I'm glad we got to this point if anything, yeah. um, I would say one last weird thing. I'm taking a school in Oklahoma right now, a digital class for Oklahoma School for the Deaf. Oh, really? In sign language, yeah. I'm in my second course right now. And um, it's sort of a combination of watching videos, then doing live chats afterwards, and then doing quizzes online. But it's like a really, really nice way, because of COVID, it's a nice way to find that there are classes that are available for you. To learn anything you want online, there's a website called edx.org, and they mm-hmm. teach literally anything you want from Harvard all the way down to, you know, basket weaving. Like anyone, wow. do actual college lectures, and they'll let you sit in. They'll let you, if you pay for it, get credit for it as well. Right. So 
it's a really interesting access for anybody but, EDF, but it's free if you don't want credit it's free if you want to audit it's free if you want to audit and some oh. classes are, will even like the one that i'm in right now will let you sit in on classes and even do part of the the conversations if you want to do like a language they'll let you sit in and be one of the people that you talk with just so they can have people there of varying hmm. skills that they can work on they, they will work on you and have their students work with you too it's really great it's actually really really nice um but highly recommended uh so yeah learning edx.org um larry checking in with you how you been how's your holidays oh i'm fine i actually got the motorcycle out it's Woo! i rode it for about an hour i guess <laughs> so 73 uh will be 73 next month still riding hanging still in there riding. <laughs> He's, he, it's now a defiance. It's just like, ah, right. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Very cool. Um, I wanted to phrase, I wanted to phrase something real quick. This show is seen by coworkers at my job. And we have some conversations about the conversation that we bring up at work. So uh, something that was brought up to me was that we have a pretty small atheist culture in my neck of the woods in Tennessee. Uh, we have ten Nashville, which is pretty, pretty, you know, secular, but we're about 45 minutes away from there. So we don't really have anything in our immediate area. And so when we meet other atheists, we tend to be very aggressively friendly with, about it. And we're like, Oh, it's you. Hey, Hey, how are you? Where are you coming from? Where are you, why are you doing over here? Hey, Larry, you don't up? have a, you don't have a atheist group in your town. No, <laughs> but we're starting one more or less. But, All right. <laughs> So the idea is, um, so the, I'm open as an atheist at my job. And for the people who know me, we we check in and I tell them about the show and uh, I let them know about the Sunday Assembly in Nashville. But like, for the most part, we play disc golf or have a good times. But the question that they had was, hey, listen, I was watching your shows. Um, can I send you questions that I have? And I said, absolutely. Feel free to send me an email. I gave him my email. And this person asked a really nice question and phrased it around a last visit she had when she went up to Sunday Assembly Nashville, where the topic of the conversation was someone who left religion and had a problem with staying out because they lack so much self-worth. Larry, what do you think? Would you explain what Sunday Assembly is? Sure. Good point. Good question. So Sunday Assembly is essentially a gathering. Of, it started out in England, but it's a format of a church. It meets once a month. It's formatted as if it's a church session, but it's entirely secular. And so for people who like the church vibe, but don't necessarily like the agenda that comes with it, mm -hmm. uh, Sunday Assembly is a really nice middle ground. And they celebrate like, life and love and people and, yes. and society. Society, you know, critical. But thinking. all secular. <laughs> yes, all secular, but very much the stand up, sit down. Uh, the music will be different based on where you go because Nashville has a lot of local bands there. So even when I was there, there was a lot of country and rock and stuff like that. Sure. The music is a lot better in Nashville than probably a lot of other cities that mm -hmm. you'll go to. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, they had like three bass guitarists one time. It was kind of crazy. It was like, oh, we asked them to come and they all three came. So they're just all three <laughs> different guys playing different licks on bass at the same time. It was crazy. But um, yeah, it's really, really nice. And um, every single time I was there, I've always felt invited. It reminded me a lot of the UU churches, the Universalist uh, right. yeah. churches, which don't which meet every week. But this is a bit more of a bigger production, if I would say. And they'll invite people to talk. I've done talks with them before. Uh, but the talk they had last month was a person who left religion and had a hard time staying out. And she, and she was talking about the idea of lacking of self-worth. And the idea to realize what's good about you is a practice skill that you don't have to, or you have no time to work on when you're in religion, because everything that you consider good about yourself, you just attribute to your God belief or your God figure. And so as a result, when you leave, you realize you lack a muscle in reaffirming why you're a good person or what's particularly good about you or what's so good about you. And that is so true. I wanted to bring up her question and I wanted to make that the topic of discussion today. So uh, my coworker asked, hi, I'm a former religious person and I've been struggling with a question about morality and virtue. In my previous faith, there was this idea that everything good about me was a gift from God and that without God, I wouldn't be able to be kind, just, or virtuous. Since leaving that belief system, I've had to reevaluate my own values and figure out what's important to me on my own. 
However, I still sometimes feel like I'm missing a framework for understanding and appreciating my own goodness. How do you think secular people can come to terms with what's good about themselves, especially when they're used to thinking of it, thinking of it as something that comes from a higher power? So I want to phrase that question. Boudreaux, I'm not going to put you on the hot seat right now, but I would like to warm up with, can you tell me some things that are good about you? And then what's the framework <clears throat> of understanding that you use to figure out and appreciate your own goodness? Okay. Um, I think I got a nice... Uh... Uh, tie in here to to my atheism. <laughs> nice. uh, what's uh, what's good about me? Um, I, I guess I I find myself very often um, uh, in in contrast to some religious people or even just uh, spiritual people uh, with regard to honesty. Where I, I you know I have a view of of lying that was that was largely reinforced by by Sam Harris his book line I, I know we're only 20 minutes in and sam Harris has already mentioned um, but but no it, it, it's um you know there, there's this this whole idea that i mean just white lies and, and and lying just is is there's rarely ever a good case to lie um and and i find myself even at 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 odds with um a benefit to me sometimes just telling the truth even though it's gonna you know cause some uncomfortability or 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 not benefit me, but just, I mean, I'd rather people just know the truth. Mm. So I, I, that's, it's a trait that I think um, not a lot of folks, um, it, it, you know, uh, keep um, at, a, at a high level. Um, even, even just kind of weird bits about, I, I've had weird thoughts about Santa Claus and, and children, you know, it's a very deceptive thing we do for a good reason. I get it, but you know, it, it, it I don't know. It, it's it's a whole nother conversation, obviously. But to your point, I, I, the 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 framework I use mm -hmm. to judge being a good person is, um, well, I've, I have very often been told when it's revealed I'm an atheist to someone I've known for a, for quite a bit of time, or or at least has known me well. They go, "Wow, you're you're a really good person for an atheist." I I, yeah. hear, that. I hear that a yeah. lot, mm -hmm. and that makes me think that. Like, what are the kind of people are you hanging out with? Or what do you think atheists really are like? Mm. But I think from that, from that, hearing that, I, I, I feel like that, that reinforces that I, I, you know, helps me be a good person and makes me think I am being a good person. So would you I also know. see the, the summits that you do uh, if you mind giving me an explanation of what the summits are, but I also feel like that's a good pool or an environment for people to be honest with each other. And, yeah. and you're a really good host for that. Would you mind talking about that a bit? Yeah, it's not quite the Sunday assembly, um, but but about once a month we get together right back here or outside yep. of the fire pit. Ty, you've been to, to several, um, and we religious people, non-religious, um, mixture of, of everything. Um, we get together and we talk, and and you know, we try not to focus too much on politics, although that creeps in often. Talk about philosophy. Talk about you know, why you believe things. Um, but yeah, and every, the, the big rule is if you want to be, you want to be honest, but you yep. also want to be respectful of everyone else's opinion. Right. We're not there to try to change minds necessarily. I have changed my mind on things. Um, uh, and then others have and admittedly, and that's a bit of honesty, right. To be honest yeah. with yourself that you've changed Absolutely. your mind. Um, I think it's great, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a lovely thing we do in Lexington. If any listeners are nearby, um, hit us up. And I'll give you an invite. What I really like about it is you'll go into a summit with one perspective, and then you'll see so many completely diverse perspectives on a particular subject you had that you realize, man, I thought I was monolithic. I thought everybody thought about this the same way. And it could have been something that you thought was just so straightforward. And then you just have people from entirely different walks of life show up and just explain how they think about something you're like. Oh man, I never thought that that was even on the table. And then the third person with a completely different idea, and you're like, "Oh, okay, so this is far more colorful of a situation." And when you leave, you just have this deeper appreciation of the idea that, okay, mine is just one in a deck of cards of potential options. And and even if you don't change your mind or or have like a, a revelation, that in its own scope is an epiphany. To that's very appreciative. We had an asexual show up once, and, and Hell yeah. he really he really <laughs> revealed some things to some yeah, of yeah, our, yeah. our panel. Was, yeah. That was an interesting group too, because you brought some yeah. other people there that was like complete on different sides of the spectrum. So that was oh, very yeah. interesting. Uh, uh, let me see what else we got. Um, Larry, 
what is so good about you and what's the framework that you've used to determine? Well, yeah, I was typing some things down so I would remember, but one of the things I had down was honesty. And uh, of course he covered that pretty well, but I'm, I'm a pretty honest person uh, and also self-honest. I don't lie to myself like a lot of people do about things. Although I'm sure somebody would say, I don't know, you're not being honest about that, but it would be because I don't perceive it. <clears throat> anyway, always open to hearing what I might not be honest with myself about. I'm a trusting person. I care for people. Um, and uh, I've got some pretty good skill sets, so that's good. I mean, I've got programming, yep. um, guitar playing, singing, I dance. You dance? Yeah. Well, I danced on TV for five years. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. Club dance. It was a Oh, yeah, that's right. It was like Soul thing. Train. I remember that. You told me about that. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, it was you know, it's a lot of fun. But I worked hard to get my skills. They, they weren't just given to me. They weren't just handed to me. Right. Um, so that's good about me that I, you know, I don't push off to some God figure. So um, I guess that's about it. Sure. Bujo, you want to go back to honesty real quick? Yeah, a, a, a short story that I just get your your guys' read on, and it, and it ties into all of this nicely. Um, I have a kid who plays plays soccer, um, and uh, I'm going to say she and blow who it is. But, um, but recently she was asked, you know, by her coach, how was, how was your Easter weekend? And then he paused and said, oh, I, I guess I'm just assuming you celebrate Easter. Um, and at that point, so our, our coach is actually pretty religious. He went to, went to uh, a religious college, uh, university, um, I, you know, so I don't know a whole lot about him other than, you know, that, um, which makes me think he's pretty religious. And he said, um, or no. And, and she said, oh, actually, uh, we don't celebrate Easter. And he was like, what? Wow. How, can I ask why? I, yeah. And she says, well, we're, we're, we're family of atheists. Um, I thought that was terribly honest of her to yeah, say. Yeah. I was I was and proud brave, depending brave. on the company. Yeah. Because I'll be perfectly honest. Yeah, uh, that's an authority figure. Yeah, and I fear a little yeah, bit she just outed herself and I mean now we're going to talk about starting lineup and you know playtime and things like that. And now I'm not believe me I'm not saying a Christian would be devious to to do that but they might but they might I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I don't like, think he really, my best friend is the arbiter of truth and justice. I can do whatever I feel like I want to do right. entirely justified. with no consequences because you can always be forgiven. Right. So, it's such a terrible situation. So yeah, should yeah. should she have lied? No, no, no. And I give her I'm kudos for that. Yeah, I'm proud of her. That's great. That's a great job. Absolutely. Yeah, because uh, it's 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 not her fault. That guy isn't aware that there are people that don't celebrate Easter, you know, like if right. anything. That and is, and he felt that he could ask her, yeah, you know, so why why don't you celebrate Easter? You know, that's that's kind of an offensive position. Yeah, it's like everybody celebrates Easter. It's like, where did you live at? That that's the question you are. But you know, again, we are Kentucky is as south as the north gets. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty well put. And to be fair, we're in the club that she's in is actually south of, of Lexington in a smaller oh, okay. community, got which it, makes got it, it a little. There are a lot more um, in God right. we trust license plates in that. Right, 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 well, right. No, no, yeah, I don't undersell the Midwest. They're they're pretty darn uh, south too. Yeah, pretty darn. But I also religious. like that she said, "I'm from I'm from a family." <laughs> Excuse of me. Atheists. Like she didn't just put it on herself. She's just like, yeah. "Hey, my whole family is atheists." And just like, oh. One, it's not like, oh, you're an atheist because whatever happened to you in your personal life made yeah. you fall out of your God. It's like, no, my whole family's atheist. It's like, oh, yeah. there are families that are he atheists. Did. That, that might have blown his mind too. He did say he, he said, I haven't met that many atheists, which good for him. Yeah. That he knows of. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. exactly. Right. Exactly. It's it's just a sign of him being sheltered, if anything. It's more of a reflection on him. But yeah. I am glad that uh, I won't say her name, but I'm glad she spoke up and, and was so like just straightforward. It's not a problem. Deal with it. This is your own. If yeah. it's your problem, it's your own problem. And such good. Uh, one of the hardest things that I have is dealing with the idea of not being my real self because of how people will react she handled it perfectly well it's like hey this is who i am it's your problem if it's your problem if it's a problem love it dig it and and yeah and there's even eight other atheist soccer players that's 
going to be totally fine. How does he not know that? That's just so bizarre. Anyway, <laughs> uh, guys, we're at you know, the bottom of the half hour. We're going to come back to this and we'll talk about frameworks and how you can be a good person and what's good about us in more detail along with other questions. Larry? Cool. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio. 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Cool. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter Five, and as usual, uh, well, we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take just a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year, and we have nearly 1,100 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables or if it's pretty weather outside on the deck. We also have a Tuesday evening Zoom ASK meeting. If you'd like to join us, email us at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or let's chat se at gmail.com. You can also find us online at Facebook and meetup.com or go to our website at knoxvilleatheist.org. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start, Start one. one. That's right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? I like to take the idea of honesty and flip it on its head a little bit. Um, I would say for me, one of the things that I'm proud about is my sense of empathy. And the empathy that I have is because I've been mistreated before, or I've been um, lied to. And I realize what that feels like. And I wouldn't want someone else to feel that same way too, because I want to try to treat people in a way how I would like to be treated. And so I and without taking that from the Bible, it's just like, I, I, and if anything, I'd like to treat them how they want to be treated too. I'm going to assume, making an assumption on my point, that we would like to have a, a, a sense of well-being and respect and, and, and um, like a high morale in work situations. Or if we have bad news coming, let them know in like an objective way that doesn't like, you know, uh, purposely... Uh, uh, and make anything particularly inflammatory or place to blame on any particular person. I have a very problem solving mindset when it comes to like resolving situations. And I come up with situations or solutions, but I don't come out with commandments. I just say, hey, these are options. It's always good to have options. And I allow people who like work for me or, or even like my managers to just have the list of the best options. And we can like come out with a good argumentation that I'm open to and try to figure out what's the best path forward. When I talked to people, even when I did so with like my table format, it wasn't an aggressive situation. I just wanted to demonstrate that you can talk to people in a really productive way and, and have really meaningful conversations with people about sensitive topics. And I felt like the most important aspect of that was not a flow chart of questions or was not setting up traps, but was trying to connect with people on an empathetic level, which takes a lot of like social dynamism and like reading the room and understanding that People might be uncomfortable and realizing, okay, if you're uncomfortable, I'm not going to push it because I'm not here to make you feel bad or or hurt you. I'm, I just generally want to talk to you. And I, I want to emphasize that in video form. And I'm willing to have this conversation with you in any way that you feel comfortable. Even if you don't want to have it, we'll stop right now. But like everything that I do is for the interest of the 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 feelings of the people that I'm working with. And I found like that's a good thing. So, and the reason why I feel like that kind of flips honesty on its head is in in some in some scopes you had mentioned like Eric or you had mentioned white lies as being something that is problematic and I agree but I also find like you can if you contextualize a lie as a lie it might be more valuable to you as a truth it sort of feels similar hmm. to a model that we were talking about at the beginning and my mom she's from the Virgin Islands so she has all these weird sayings but she has a saying where it's like you know, I can trust the moon more than I can trust the sun, even though the moon is just a reflection of the sun's light. The moon is a lying to me because it doesn't actually glow in the night sky. It just reflects the sun's light. So even though the moon is lying to me, I can trust it more because I can keep an eye on it. And like mm. the, the idea behind that is if I know a lie is a lie, then I can 
I can, if I know it's a piece of fiction and I'm aware of that, I can still use that as a good model and make it useful for me moving forward. And so I would say like, yeah, I wouldn't literally, if I had kids, I wouldn't literally tell them that Santa Claus exists, but I would say, hey, there's a fun tradition where we pretend that there's a guy named Santa and he he does all these things and let's just celebrate it, but not as like a literal guy visiting my house who's going to come through my chimney, but just as a, hey, it's it's the spirit of the season. These are the folklores we tell. It might be based on like true history, but it's just a fun thing we do. Let's go have some fun. Same thing with the Easter bunny. Like, hey, let's go pick up some plastic eggshells. I'm not going to literally tell the kid that this came from a rabbit. They're mammals. They don't lay eggs. We know this. Well, some uh, uh, there's a weird of class of them in Australia that do, but we don't count them as real things. Australia is a weird place. <laughs> but, but like, I think I find that if you can just be honest with your kids and say, hey, this is not real, but we're going to have fun in the scope of it anyway. Like, that's our framework. That could work out really well. What do you think, yeah. Pedro? There, There is one little caveat to that. Talk that to is, me. if if you do that with your children, mm. now you re- now you are are committing them to have to lie to their friends because oh. one of the biggest dangers to being honest about Santa Claus is, you know, how young your child is when that happens and they're spoiling it for other families, which can be really, really devastating to some, some families. I say, and really, I uh, say, do that, do that. Anyway, no. it's, it's other families fault for telling them literally that there's a guy in a red suit visiting their home in the first place. That freaked me I, out when I was told that. I like I, I wouldn't want that. Yeah. But like if you Say said hey, this isn't real <laughs> and other people might freak out, but just your kid, you're gonna have fun. They're gonna figure that out eventually. Like that shouldn't be your onus. That's you you do what do you, you do think? pay a, a social cost though? I mean, your 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 kid then would be in, in a minority and excluded from things. And it, it my 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 point is that's there's some some nuance to it. If I, well, I'm totally with you. Yeah, um, there are but, costs either side. Yeah, yeah, like you could have a dumb kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'll, I'll that, East, that rabbits lay eggs until they're 18 years old. And we're like, what do you mean you don't believe they ask their soccer uh, training kids? Yeah. Like, what do you mean you don't believe egg, uh, rabbits lay eggs? That's that's weird. I've never heard of that before. It's like you're 18 and uh-huh. you believe that you're you right. coach kids in high school and you believe that that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would be a little hesitant, though, to burden my kindergarten kid with that knowledge um because we did lie to our kids when they were very very young both kids figured it out pretty early anyway and yeah. probably did probably because of the way we phrase things hmm. you know we made it seem kind of you know i don't we made it seem we, we were kind of revealing the lie a little bit. right 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 but yeah if you take it if you have a kindergarten kid and they know the truth and you either ask them to lie or just let them out in the wild and, and they tell their friends. I mean, now or not say anything. Yeah. But then you let people assume things about you then. Yeah. But wouldn't, but it, be good, wouldn't it be good to have a bunch of people tell the truth about stuff in, in general? Like, isn't that like Tyrone, you can't tell people to be inclusive and not racist because that might hurt their feelings and make them be less racist when they go out in public. It's like, right. That's that's those are good things. Like you can't (laughs) tell people the truth because they might say true things when they go outside. It's like, yeah, that's a good thing Mm. too, especially for when it comes from kids. Because then Mm. it's the parent who is trying to enforce the lie who has to go out of their way to try to tell reinforce and reinforce a lie. Mm. It's like, don't do that to my kid. He's telling the truth. What's your problem? He's like, well, I'm telling my child a lie. So I was like, that's your fault. That's your own thing. That's your thing. Mm. I tell my kid the truth. Deal with it. You know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm going to go extreme, extreme. There's a knock on, on the house that Anne Frank is hiding in. Yeah. Right. Are there, are there any, any Jewish people in this house? You were, you brought up a really good point. Uh, so this goes back to my uh, scope of empathy because my, my argument, and this is interesting because if dread was here as well, um, you would be lying to a person at the door who said, Hey, is there Jewish people here? And I don't want my Jewish people that I'm hiding to be, uh, found, I would lie, but that's not what I ought to do. Morally, I shouldn't yeah. lie to people, but what I ought to do and what I should do are two different things yes. in, mm-hmm. in my head. And so what I use I as my moral scope is just a way, is just a way to, oh, sorry. What I use as my morality scope is just a system for how would I manage my actions in a general sense, but in very specific terms, I use my should cases and I try to inform them as best as I can with my ethics 
And I might not always pick the most moral <laughs> option, but I am picking an option that I feel like leads to the least needless harm. And yeah. I feel like well, in that scope, I'll be all right. What's up, Larry? Well, I think you hit on it. Uh, the most moral option. You have, a, you have a moral obligation to tell the truth, but you also have a most moral or a more moral option of protecting people that you care about or just protecting people from an autocratic uh, uh, government. Right. Um, you know, you just have to go with the most moral um, option at the time. And in some, think. in some capacities, I would say uh, your daughter speaking up that she comes from an atheist family is a very similar to the example where she had the option to lie to keep herself in a, a potentially good status and not have this coach question his own idea of like how people around him are different she just expressed herself honestly and was that the most moral thing she could have done when she's in a team environment and it's really important to have a cohesive nature amongst all these different people to stand out as someone who might be very different fundamentally than everybody else and risk maybe potentially her future or how other people see her it's like no i'm just going to be honest with myself that is the the least personally harmful path for me to take and whether or not it was the most moral uh in in that capacity could be you know uh it could be essentially argued one way or the other but i find like her taking the value of like hey i'm gonna whatever harm it causes you for me to say this i'm gonna say it anyway and it's more important for me to be honest with who i am personally than uh, to risk hurting your your degree of comfort but it's a measurement that you make in your head yeah. And when you get the knock on your door from the Nazis, you have to make another measurement too. Yeah. And it's not always honesty that wins. In my opinion, yeah. it's just the needless harm that I can avoid that wins. And um, I find that to be like a really interesting path because morality, again, is not a set of rules that you follow and a dictate. It's a system, right? And so this, the, as a system, we're going to have a lot of flexibility and exceptions that we'll, we'll take. And so my, my most fundamental crutch would be empathy and the avoidance of needless harm, because I don't want other people to go through harm. And so I will lie to the Nazi that's knocking at my door. I will speak up to the coach that asked me if I'm an atheist. And in other situations, I'll weigh them in the moment and, and try to move forward with that. What do you think, Blair, or uh, Boudreaux? So I, I would dare say that this is a really interesting dichotomy we've created here, because you're right. Sure. Nazis on the door, pretty obvious what to do. What Vivian did with the Edit that out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what, what this lovely girl did with her coach um, was was well, I was I was proud of her and and all that. I think she did the right thing. Yeah. There is a little. She paid. She's going to potentially pay a little social cost to it. But now go in the middle and the kindergartner. I would dare say that I'm. Uh, how how did you put it? Uh, um, taking different measurements now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm, now I'm asking a young child to be burdened with this. Uh, this thing that I don't think that they're old enough to handle where you're asking them to either be uh, uh, either, either um, tell the truth or, or uh, uh, avoid the conversation or don't bring it up. And again, I think, uh, how did you put it? The, the least amount of harm, the child is going to be harmed by telling the truth. Uh, they, I guarantee other parents are going to get upset. Um, other children are going to be mad at them. Because they're so young and they're they're definitely in the minority, I think there is a little bit here. Here, I would definitely do the math and say mm, maybe it's best to just not bring this up uh, so, with the child as, as much. But you already alluded to the idea, and this is really good because it's it all falls into the idea of like finding good reasons for someone to um, practice feeling good about themselves yeah. and. One of the, the things that were brought up in um, the original question was, it's hard for me to practice feeling good about myself because I never got the opportunity to do so. Because when I was in my religion, I always attributed my good to my God belief. Right. But if we value honesty, right, how do you get a pra how do you when do you get a chance to practice that if you don't ever get a chance to be honest with people? And Second grade. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying not kindergarten uh, but you could frame it with some nuance such that i know and i understand this is a difficult thing for a kindergarten you were in your head saying it's easier for me to just lie to you until you get better cognition skills so that i can tell you more elaborate nuance with how the universe works and apologize for telling you a lie previously but i also feel like there 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 may potentially just be a way to just say hey 
We can talk about that later. Or just say, listen, people, it's not real, but people get angry if you say it because they think it's real. And we can sit down and like have a whole half hour conversation about that. And I can remind you about that on a regular basis. But for the most part, you know, this isn't real. Let's let's just enjoy it anyway, though. It's a story. It's a really good thing. And there's a lot of things that we celebrate. All of our holidays are just stories. Like most of them are just basically stories. So let's just have fun in that same scope. And and if you they kids then go out and do that, they're going to have to learn the repercussions of like still getting people angry anyway. But like at least you were honest with them and they had the capability to use those tools and figure out the consequences of their actions on their own. On, on a low stakes skill, because no one's going to not vote for them for act, incidentally telling another kindergartner that Santa Claus wasn't real. But they might not vote for them or find harm if they're a doctor that didn't want to give them an abortion because their God belief would get in the way. Like there's there's times to like fundamentally let them get the exercise of practicing the idea of like, I have stories that I follow, but I can break them in the interests of humanity. Larry, I'm sorry, you were raising. Well, your the thing about it is, uh, it's not just like Santa Claus that that parents tell their kids at a very early age. It's also the whole religious package. You know, they start, you know, just as soon as they're able to put their hands together at the table, you know, and, mm. and do that. Yes. Uh, it's just when they're about seven or eight years old, they disabuse them of Santa Claus. So it's not a conversation you really can't have. It's everywhere, you know. Right. The, the weather forecaster tells you that they've caught Santa Claus on radar. Right. You know, Here, you've got to have the conversation. You can't just ignore it. Here, my other thing is, as soon as you bring a baby to church, it's fair game to tell them that Santa Claus doesn't exist because you are now behind in a race of indoctrination where Christians have codified it to where it's a good value oriented situation where they even have schools in their church settings where they can teach kids whatever they want and they break away from their parents. If they can do that in a church, you should have authority, liability, and all the punitive or all the accessibility measures possible to just express to your kid at any age you deem fit santa claus isn't real because they they are fundamentally taking their children and raising them in in indoctrinated circles so if anything teach them the truth and teach them like the measures of critical thinking as soon as you possibly can because we live in a poisoned world we live in a world where there's poisonous air in the system and the sooner you can put a gas mask on the better I wouldn't say give them till second grade and be like, just second some of this poison because you don't want to make the 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 poison zombie people offended. It's like, no, no, no. Give me that gas mask. Give me some clean oxygen as soon yeah. as possible. I might make a people offended because I'm wearing a face mask. We've seen that happen. But you know what? It's in my best interest. And when people ask me why I'm wearing it, I'm going to just tell them and express myself as honestly as possible. Because what if we lived in a world where we didn't have that happen? And she was a little scared to express herself. Maybe that could have been because she'd been living in a world where she didn't want to offend people her entire life. And when she was brought up to that moment, she decided not to offend instead of being her real self. That would have been a detriment. I would have said, like, that's a sad situation. I feel like the idea of just letting people know, as you said, the truth, being honest, and letting them know the harm that can come with uh unabashed honesty when they express it to other people letting them know that not telling them not to do it but just letting them know that it's there that could be a really good demonstration of hey i have faith in you as a person as my adult uh, as a parent to a child and i trust you and and again i'm not speaking as a person that has a child so but i do feel like hopefully these these points are just options they're not me telling you what to do with your kids i'm just thinking like out loud but i i do feel like we should at least reinforce the idea as young as possible that honesty is not something that we should hide until we feel like people are old enough to handle it. I feel like that is a skill that we should immediately train because people are being lied to as soon as they're born. Yeah, I I, I was hearing as soon as possible, which is kind of my point. Um, but I, I think maybe another factor to this is just knowing your kid, mm. uh, knowing knowing how your kid, you know, taking the best approach to how your kid's going to react to it. And maybe some kids will be great at kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, other kids, you might be like, uh, they're going to pay a social price for this. I know they are. Maybe I want to wait to first or second grade. Now I will say I am advocating what you said as soon as possible. And we did with our kids. We, we actually probably told our kids, uh, before they were probably ready, but we, mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted that gas mask on as soon as I could. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can tell you, uh, for sure. I know of, of kids that have, um, outed themselves as atheists yeah. at, at a young age and have really paid a price for it. Now, I'm not saying you lie to them about uh, religion um, sure. by any stretch, but 
you got to be really careful with, with, with that. And maybe your point, talk to your kids often, reinforce this. And it's probably a different thing for me because I was religious when I was a kid, but I was also the only black kid in a lot of the schools that I was in. So it was a lot easier for me to be immediately judged on things that weren't necessarily entirely in my control to begin with already. So it was never a big deal that uh, I believed in a God or didn't believe in a God. It was just always a big deal that I looked black to certain people. And for some people, that was a problem. And navigating that was like my biggest priority. And now that I'm an open atheist, I'm still more concerned with how people tolerate with me being black because there are just, you know, there's that one in a hundred where it's a problem. But um, the atheist thing is a new thing that I'm still getting used to ex- expressing. I'm more comfortable with it now. And I found like the bigger deal is just expressing it without the baggage of, oh, I hope I don't make this person angry. And I hope my social circumstances aren't affected by the fact it's like I'm an adult and I'm capable of controlling who I want in my life and who's my chosen family and who my friends are and who I want to hang out with. At, with that, with that sort of like, self-respect it's a lot easier for me to just be like i'm an atheist is that a problem for you because it's not a problem for me oh it's not a problem for you let's hang out more (laughs) and that's an easy thing for me to like deal with and i would say in your social circumstance for a kid it's i'm sorry sorry one last but one last point in your social circumstances it's a very cool thing to know that you have no obligation to hang out with people who would have a problem with you being your real self and knowing how to call those people out of your life and stick with the people who are cool with you being your real self is the fundamental aspect in my head of hanging out with a good, healthy social circle. And you don't get the experience of cutting out the weeds without expressing who you are and being honest. Um, and that's a skill too, if, if I can throw that out. Larry, I'm sorry. For no, I was just going to say that self-worth and discretion are both good skills to have. And the yes. earlier you can get them, the better. Yes. But, uh, I would teach the child discretion in certain situations and honesty or at least self-reflection or in, in public uh, is a good skill to know when to use and when not to use. Yeah. Eric, I had a question. If um, yeah. you were at kindergarten age with your kids, and one of them came back and said, hey, I told Billy, um, Billy was scared. He was crying because he thought uh, Santa Claus didn't give him his Xbox that he wanted. And I told him, actually, there's no Santa. It, you probably, your parents probably just didn't know that you wanted an Xbox or maybe it could have been something else. But he started crying again because I told him Santa Claus wasn't real. Uh, did I do something wrong? Like, how would you, how would you react to that? Yeah, again, I, I mean... Uh, it's it's obviously complicated and and varies uh, across the board but mm. i mean doing something like that can can have a pretty big effect on a small classroom right i mean you 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 tell someone the truth that way um and i mean you're really you're you're really stepping into outside of a boundary i th- i think i I'm, I'm maybe arguing with myself here a little bit because i'm not sure i fully agree with the fact but I mean, that family chose to tell their kid this, this make-believe. This yeah, 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 yeah. And with the, no- and, with the knowledge that one day it's going to be overturned by someone who's just being honest with them, right? But, but I will say that, that absolutely there is a, a um, just, just like having a, a imaginary God in, in the sky, you have a built-in babysitter. When you have the Santa Claus lie, mm. you have, look, you need to go clean your room. Otherwise, you're not getting presents. Right. I mean, that is a powerful motivating thing you know whether yeah, it's a lie it's or not a big carrot on a stick it, it is and a lot of parents rely on that mm. for, uh, for you know before certainly between november and december uh so you are now you now you're telling this kid something that's going to have an effect on how the parents are uh, uh i don't know it, it again honesty is probably always best but you're they're so young i don't I, it's a burden to ask them to to lie it's a burden to ask them to to be careful of the words they choose uh and again i feel like i'm arguing myself a little bit because i could probably make the same make another argument to you know, just just <clears throat> to your point too so well, wanted, you can, you can ahead, just as easily say you don't want to i mean to that point you don't have to go to the kids and say you know there's no santa claus you can right. go to the kid and say you know a lot of people believe in santa claus i don't you know you have to make up your own mind you know, that kind of thing. That but works look at really the well. evidence. 
you know, that a person could go all around the world, visit every household in a single night, give everybody presents, you know, because the, the presents are made by elves, you know, think about the evidence. Six uh, years soon, old. Yeah. yeah. Six years no, old. You're no. asking a lot from us. Well, I like the idea of like, everybody believes in it. I don't. And now you, now there's a kid who realizes that not everybody believes in Santa and even their parent doesn't believe it. That could be massive for just a kid. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I didn't tell him Santa Claus didn't exist. Right. I'm just letting him know that people believe different things. And I right. think even a six-year-old can get And that's that. a good setup for the rest of the world. Yeah. You know, but that, that's where I would, life. I would put the caveat that for six-year-olds that can handle that, sure. But mm-hmm. there are sure. plenty of six-years out there where this sure. would blow their mind. Or, I mean, or they would go, they do it wrong, right? I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising if they, you know, miss the point somehow sure. and, and they say it wrong and, and then it make things worse so know your children uh, the comments yeah, on this know your children be, yeah the comments on this are going to be amazing i love I it i love it i want to throw out a, i want to throw out one last one we got like four minutes left five minutes left but the idea would be like if i had a kid and they said hey when we were doing the pledge of allegiance i didn't say under god and my teacher got in my face and said why aren't you saying the full pledge of allegiance and i told him because i don't believe in god and then and and now I have like a, a slip of paper that said I had to talk to you about it. And I what am I supposed to say about that? I would say continue not saying it. Like regardless of whatever age, I would be so impressed with a child who is saying, like, they were forcing me to be something I wasn't. And I don't have enough evidence to support this thing that they're telling tell me to be. And I'm willing to say it if they can demonstrate it, but I don't have the evidence to support that. I'm just like, you're saying all these amazing things and you're so young. I would never want to tarnish that with a lie or anything like that. And in the same scope with Santa Claus, if I have a kid that's already questioning the idea of Santa, I'm not going to reinforce the the lie anymore. But I would also would never give it to them to by default. I would just say, hey, there are people that believe different things and I don't believe everything that everybody believes. And you might hear things like that. And so feel free to talk to me about any of this. And if you say something that makes someone upset, we'll, you are going to have to deal with those consequences because that's going to happen a lot of times in your life. We live in that kind of reality. And I'll also have to tell them some additional things too because they're black. And I'll be like, just watch out who you talk to. <laughs> there's, some, there's different conversations we have. But I'm saying like, for the most part, don't ever feel bad for the being your real self because you need to learn how to develop your own self-worth and maybe that's a longer discussion to have when you're more mature but something people have when they're in religion is they don't have the ability to be happy being them real selves and they fall into identity of a dogma so when you are your real self you need to be able to stand on a good foundation of that confidence of who you really are and loving yourself for who you are and finding the good in you you only do that when you are actually expressing yourself and being real and like you said, with your honesty, that's that's good. Find the right time to have it with your kid. But I feel like there's other ways you can phrase it to where they can start their stepping stones a little bit earlier, too. Uh, and and that's a conversation you have with your own children. Um, Eric, Bujo, anything that you'd like to plug for uh, next week? Uh, I, I will say that that we had a lovely discussion about abortion at Summit. And we wow. did come up with the answer, by the way. We, we've nice. solved it. Fantastic. Um, Instead of an abortion, um, we need to build the technology for a deportation, which is to say any woman ever wants to not have the child that's in her, it, it can be taken out very safely um, and put into this machine, and the machine will carry it to term. And uh, I think if that, if that technology existed, the argument is now done. Unless the, the Christians uh, really want that woman to go through labor, and if that's their point, then 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 we have a whole another conversation. <laughs> well, <now. laughs> well, but if you if you remove labor from the equation, I think mm. we have the perfect solution. Uh, so. My my <laughs> my thing to plug is you should check this out. There was such a thing as a birth control measure for men because it got no funding because birth control for men is very very limited funding. But it was basically something that tasted like a tic tac in the same pill form, and when you eat it. For the next 36 hours or like something, a period of time, they only tested this on, on, on mammals, not humans, obviously. It took away the, the, the long tail that's on sperm. or, or oh. So they couldn't travel anymore. It basically knocked out the gene that caused their, their tails to cause them to travel. So basically, you had a pill that made you uh, non uh, Infertile. 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 <clears throat> and I'm like, well, why doesn't that exist? Because no one wants to fund birth control for men because it's seen as a woman's obligation to maintain that but i was saying if we change that 
to the point where it was an effective birth control measure for men and you just pop a little tic tac and you're you're just good to go for the next day i think a lot of these conversations would be off and you just sell them as cheap as tic tacs at discount lines and, and grocery stores like put they'd them have to make them effective immediately i mean like within 10 seconds yeah <laughs> yeah the question of how effective it would be in an actual <laughs> human being for i i don't yeah. i forgot that time but it was at least for 36 hours they were out and I'm thinking, like, if you just take that regularly, like how you do for birth control for women, you yeah, take it right. regularly, mm -hmm. you'd be good. Sure. If you're sexually active, just take one a day, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yeah, I, I've I've heard arguments for that, and and been told that, or the thought is that men are just too irresponsible that it, it wouldn't work. And uh, but so yeah, let women do it. Honest. Basically, is, is no, 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 no. I'm just saying, if you want it to be hundred. effective, you yeah. need a responsible party to do it. And a 18 year old, you know, horny teenager is is not yeah. gonna take it reliably yeah. yeah if you associate that with if you associate it with like um sorry we're almost over time if you associate it with oh i'm so cool i have to take these pills because yeah. i have a lot of sex then uh -huh. kids will take it all you have to do is that because people drink coca-cola and yeah. and do all bunch of stuff that they don't necessarily have to do but they do it anyway anyway larry mm -hmm. sorry for taking up so much time <laughs> okay good. did you want to plug anything before we go no we're almost out of time go for okay. it okay um this uh you can find my stuff on uh, digitalfreethought.com be sure to click the blog button uh for our radio show archives atheist songs and many articles on the subject you can find my book what's it all about or atheism <laughs> what's it all about on amazon <laughs> my youtube channel is at doubter five remember everybody is going to somebody else's hell the time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock here on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. everybody.